Oh no, we're not offline. So, uh, so we're at the stage actually in this class where maybe we can actually do something a little bit useful with the um, the knowledge uh, knowledge we have. Um, this one doesn't look like it wants to work, and we'll come back to the other ones in due course. But this is perhaps more germane to, to what we might be dealing with. So some of you are certainly interested in open flows around turbines. Uh, some subset of you are interested perhaps in porous media flows for uh, getting gas or petroleum out of the ground or getting or pumping, getting water out of the ground or getting contaminants out of the ground. Uh, and so what we're doing now is we're trying to uh, reorganize our thoughts to see what we've learned might actually be useful to us in, in, in perhaps applications and the things that you'll see in the last two years of your, your education on campus, uh, if you're now risen, risen juniors, one and a half years almost. I guess one and three quarter years, we're halfway through the, the, the semester. Um, and so what we talked about last time was the fact that we could take what we've learned so far and use that in some useful way to be able to say something about um, behaviors in those kinds of systems. So we ran out of time, but I attached it to the end of last week's uh, video, uh, not because it's examinable, but, but because it links into the kinds of things that you uh, might be doing in your life. And so just to run through that very, very quickly again, the, the the, actually, the, the system that we're looking at here is kind of interesting. So I used to have a colleague here. His name is Avrami Grader. He used to be in petroleum engineering. He left to work for a company called Ingrain. Ingrain is the company to do this. And so what they do is they take uh, chips that come out of uh, boreholes that get flung out as you drill down to 9,000 feet in the Marcellus, for instance. Uh, you X-ray CT them to be able to look at the porosity. And then you use that information of the pore structure to be able to run a model just like this to be able to look at the fluid transmission characteristics, aka the permeability of hydraulic conductivity, those, which allows you to say something about how quickly you'll be able to gas, get gas out of it. So it's very interesting technology. And so Ingrain is the, the company that, that does that. Very, very uh, clever idea, I, I think. I'm not sure how they're doing financially, but it's, uh, whether it's a, a go, but it was a startup, and uh, it's just a, an interesting idea. And so this is a little bit more sophisticated than we would do. But typically what we might want to do is we talked about taking this differential cubed and looking at an average way of what the transmission characteristics would be of that cube. And actually what we can do is we can use um, conservation of mass to basically write a system of equations that allow us to solve for that. And so we kind of alluded to this last time. The idea is that we could take a little cube and we could look at mass rates out of the cube. We could look at uh, accumulation in the cube. And if we look at that, then the only thing that's different from this differential cube than any of the cubes that we've looked at in Reynolds transport theorem, which is what this represents, is that they happen to be cubic. And in Reynolds transport theorem, they're just arbitrary shapes. And we don't care about what's happening inside them, but we just care about what crosses the boundaries and what accumulates inside them. But if we want to, what we could do is we could take this conservation of mass equation and we could say that the, the volume of this um, cube, and of course the volume of this cube is going to be dx dy dz, doesn't really matter, dy dx dz, I don't mean to write it that way. And we can say it's not going to change. And so that's going to be the control volume that we have. And we divide our body, we divide this room up into a hundred thousands of them, all in, a, all in this cubic lattice. That, and we can look at airflow into or out of them and do the accounting uh, digitally, which is really what, uh, what we do. And so if we throw this term away, then the differential statement, which we got last time, is something like this. Um, uh, it's the volume in equals volume out term on the right on this part and this is the, the accumulation of, of mass because density if density increases it means you're cramming more air into the tire and the tire volume isn't changing in any way and so that's the basic expression that ends up being used and so as you, if you go through your 
rest of your career, uh, what you'll learn about is, if you haven't already, is something called Darcy's Law, which says that if you take um, a tube of co a core, a piece of rock, if you like, and you place a pressure gradient across it from P1 to P2, it's purely observationally observed um, that this is of some length L, this is of some cross-sectional area A, then it, merely by observation in Darcy's law, or if you want to write it out correctly, Henri Darcy, in the Public Works Bureau of Avignon, where you looked at fountains and noticed that fountains flow twice as fast if you have twice the pressure acting on them. That's really what his observation was. So Darcy's law is basically that volumetric flow rate is equal to cross-sectional area times a coefficient, which he didn't quite term this way. He didn't quite write it this way. A coefficient which is called permeability. and multiplied through by the change in pressure that occurs over a length. And this change in pressure, uh, delta P, is just equal to um, P2 minus P1. No, actually, P1 minus P2. And this is the x direction, and so we use P1 minus P2 um, and it's typically written as this, as a differential, a derivative, for a small change in pressure over a small length, say x. And if we divide the volumetric flow rate by the cross-sectional area, then we just get an average velocity that comes out of the system. And so the only thing that we should modify here is the, this way of writing it is that the flow velocity in an average sense, not in the pores, but in an average sense, is equal to permeability divided by dynamic viscosity and the pressure gradient, dpdx. And actually there's a negative term here. And the negative term here is that if you have a pressure gradient going from high pressure to low pressure, the flow is going to be to the left. And so since this is really a vectoral property and, and velocity has um, direction as well as magnitude, then the pressure gradient is positive, right? So this is x and this is p. So any gradient in this quadrant is positive. If it's negative, it's be like this. And so a positive gradient gives a velocity in the minus x direction. So this is just to do that, okay? So why do we do that? Well, we do that because in this continuity equation, we have a term that relates to velocity. And so presumably, we could substitute this velocity in for that term. And that would give us the rate at which we get fluid going through the system as a function of the pressure. And that's useful to us because we can measure the pressure typically in, in situ. The other case is that we have another term in here which relates to the accumulation, how the density of the fluid might change. And so, bless you, so we can use, we'll box this, but we'll also talk about accumulation. And, well, what else can we do? We have volume here, and we have volume here. Let's just get rid of them. So we have a term that is equal to a change in density in the control volume as a function of time. What we're going to do is we're going to substitute this velocity term in here, so this equation then will be written in terms of pressure. So what we might like to do is have an equation for this that relates the density to a change in pressure. We know how to do that for gas, but let's not go there. Let's do it for a, a slightly compressible fluid. Actually, this would apply to either one. And let's multiply through by uh, pressure, top and bottom. I've done this many times before. So now we have a term that includes pressure and how it changes with time, but also a term which includes how density changes as a function of pressure. 
And what we could also do is pre-multiply this by an original density, top and bottom, right? So all we've done is we've taken this term here, which is change in density with time, this term. We've multiplied by 1, and we've multiplied it by 1. And our reason for doing that is that now, if you remember, if you remember that we defined the modulus of a fluid as equal to the change in pressure divided by the change in density over an original density. And so we can find that term in here somewhere. This is pressure, this is density, and so this term here, I'm guessing, is equal to what we've called the modulus. And if you're a petroleum engineer, the modulus is equal to just 1 over the compressibility for everybody. The bulk modulus is equal to 1 over the compressibility, just like electrical resistance is equal to the reciprocal of electrical conductivity. Same, same deal. And so we could write this term, which is just, of course, this term is just d rho dt. Let me write that out. So d rho dt is this. We've just multiplied top and bottom by 1. So this is going to be equal to um, density times modulus times change in pressure with time. Sorry, one over modulus. Right. This is this is uh, yeah, this is one over modulus. And so this is actually compressibility. And so this is the same as density times compressibility times change in pressure with time. And so the reason for going through this is now we have a way of taking this term here, which is this, and we have a way of taking this term here which is this, and if we squeeze them both into the same equation, we have density, compressibility, change in pressure with time, is equal to, again, it should be density. Let's substitute this term in for here, and we have a change with x. We're going to reward that, the other terms, sorry, times minus, permeability, viscosity, change in pressure with location. So this is just a multiplier equals zero. And so all we've done is we've thrown in this term. Let's ignore flows in the other direction so we don't have to deal with this. And so if I write this out in longhand in a way that uh, each of you might be able to deal with, well, we get rid of the densities. Let's not care. So we can write it for petroleum engineers as in terms of rate of change of pressure with time, this is accumulation, this is a negative, is equal to permeability over viscosity. It's the second partial, so I'm just taking these two partials and writing them together. And that's the flow equation that you'll use in the last two years of your class. And if you work in kind of groundwater hydrology, in, you'll note that, for instance, pressure is equal to pressure over unit weight is equal to a head, an elevation head. We'll ignore the fact that there's a, an elevation term in there. There is actually an extra term, right, in this. What we've the, the two Bernoulli terms that contribute to the hydraulic grade line, if you remember. And if you make that substitution, you'd end up with an equation that defines something in terms of a specific storage a change in head as a function of time. It's a direct corollary to this. Um, hydraulic conductivity and change in head as a function of x. So this is for groundwater flow and this is for petroleum. I mean, they're the same equations. Um, it's just that They've grown up in different literatures, and they, they, they're used in the same way. In petroleum engineering, pressures are very high, so phase changes are important. So writing behavior in terms of pressures makes sense. In groundwater hydrology, pressures are usually relatively low. And the effect of gravity term, this term here, is much higher. And so it's usually written in a slightly different way. And this term is here is referred to as hydraulic conductivity. And this is referred to as specific storage, for what it matters.
And the other piece of information, I guess, that might be useful to you, I'm running out of space, but let me do it up here because it makes the whole thing make sense, is that you can relate permeabilities to hydraulic conductivities. Permeability, units of length squared over Pascal seconds, are equal to hydraulic conductivities, which are units of length over time, length per second, divided by uh, unit weight, which is Pascal's per meter, right? Or kilonewton or newtons per meter cubed. So this is Pascal's per meter. So you can check that these two things match up. But this is hydraulic conductivity, which is used by groundwater hydrologists, which I definitively use the uppercase K for, and this is uh, permeability. And so just different ways of, of writing equations. So you'll see those uh, in legions. Perhaps you're seeing them already if you're talking about rock and fluid properties in petroleum. If you're taking g 452, uh, imagine you're talking about the groundwater flow equation. And so that comes directly out of conservation of mass. And so maybe the curious thing about this, and I think the link back to this, is that we've solved this system only using conservation of mass, not conservation of momentum. And the reason that we can do that is that we've basically assumed in this term here that we don't care about momentum changes, v squared over 2g. We've thrown away the v squared over 2g term in thinking about this. And so as a re result of Darcy's law, Darcy's law is basically the way of saying that in going from upstream to downstream, we've lost energy because we no longer have the same fluid pressure downstream as we did upstream. It's exactly the same as taking this bag and pushing it across the table, is that by pulling fluid through this porous medium, it's using up energy to drag itself past all the, the, the static grains that it has to move past. And so our way of looking at energy losses in the system is basically through Darcy's law. So maybe a bit esoteric, but maybe, hopefully it ties things in to the relevance of why we're talking about these kind of arbitrary, arbitrary things. And so if you wanted to, you'd be able to use that to solve problems. Okay, so that's the first part of what we're dealing with. We probably won't get as far as I thought. So we've taken, for instance, um, conservation of mass equation, and we've written it instead of in an integral way, we've written it as a differential. And we've used that differential to be able to allow us to write an equation, which importantly is defined in terms of one term, pressure or head, which allows you to solve one equation for one variable. And so you can calculate what flow rates are in, in porous media. As I say, the interesting thing about that is, is we've solved this for this kind of loss of energy only by looking at conservation of mass, not by conservation of momentum, which is kind of the traditional way that we've done it, because when we use Bernoulli's equation, the energy equation is Bernoulli's with the head loss term and also the pump uh, input term as well, but we haven't had to use that this time. So the other thing that we can do is we can use this victory, if you like, to look at kinematics, kinematics of flow. And kinematics of flow is a very powerful technique that's used to solve things from um, the, the pressures that you might have on a, um, a turbine blade or a propeller or a wing to give you lift to looking also at porous medium flows. And it, it revolves, well, yeah, I guess it resol revolves around this, this basic idea. And so again, um, this is a bit more math than I really wanted to deal with, but let's, let's look at the big concepts. So the big concepts are this. So actually, let's, let's scoot back to, to, to doing this. So let's imagine, I took this, these notes over off MIT's uh, website for fluid mechanics class. You might be happy that you're not doing this fluid mechanics class. I'm happy I'm not doing this fluid mechanics class. Um, but to, to make this point. And so here's the idea. And so the idea is that maybe we can define some flow lines in a system. And the flow lines might say that we have flow along these individual pathways. And presumably, we could write an expression for these. And it, if we think of um, an xy coordinate system, that expression would be y is equal to mx plus c, which for this line, it would just be equal to C, right? The equation of this line has no gradient. 
So as you go in the x direction, y doesn't change, so y is just a constant. So you, we can define an equation that represents this line. Let's say that we could also define an equation that represents these lines. So this represents flow across the board from uh, your left to your right. And so let's say that this represents flow where you inject water here into the air or into a porous medium and it flows outwards along all of these streamlines. And you could write a similar equation for this, y equals some function of x. Let's say that then you take these two and you add them together and you superpose their effects. Then what you'd find is that if you're injecting fluid into this kind of steady flow field, what happens is the fluid kind of is fighting against the current to get up here and then it turns around and it goes back in this direction and that's the flow line you get. If it's coming out here and starting off in this direction, then it's going in this direction. And if it starts out here, it comes down here uh, and it gets um, hijacked and taken off at the stagnation point around here. So all we've done is we've superposed one very simple flow geometry, another very simple flow geometry, and we have a much more complex flow geometry. And so you could imagine, for instance, that if you have um, an airfoil, which kind of looks like this. Huh? This is an ellipse, but, um, but it looks a bit like an airfoil. Then if you wanted to know the flow around this airfoil to figure out exactly what the pressure was acting on this upper surface to see if it would actually work as an airfoil, then one approximation would be to do this, to do this by, by, by making the shape. Because we know that, by definition, this is a streamline, and so no fluid can go across this. And so by definition, it's basically the same as this outer boundary that we, no, I'm going to leave that, I guess. It's basically the same as this outer boundary. So if you imagine instead of putting in fluid as a source, but also having a sink, so you're sucking fluid out of this. So in other words, the flow paths for this would be here, and they'd go like this to here. And you combine this with this steady flow field then what you end up getting is something like this, which looks a bit more like your, your wing, right? You could imagine it being a bit longer and it would be a symmetrical wing. You could imagine maybe having the flow instead of coming horizontally in here like this, maybe the flow would come in like this, in which case it would look much more like a wing because it would be like this. It would have a different angle of attack. And so that's the idea of, of streamlines. So the idea is basically this is if you can combine these uh, equations for flow together, uh, simple equations just like uh, this, then what you can do is if you recreate the boundary conditions that make sense to your actual structure, then you've actually solved the problem. And so if you can use these streamlines to be able to figure out exactly what, for instance, the pressure was at these points, you could say something about the amount of lift you'd have on your wing. Um, and so it has relevance to be able to be able to look at flow around a wing. Uh, it's also of interest to be able to look at, say, contaminated waste sites. So if you imagine if this is a contaminated waste site looking in plan view, and you're interested in containing all the stuff here and not allowing it to flow anywhere, then what you could do is you could do pump and treat. You pump fluid out of this point, and you clean it, and then you re-inject clean water in this point. And if this is the steady groundwater flow that's occurring around it, then you have a great system where none of the stuff that you have that's in this contaminated region is actually escaping to the exterior environment. And so you can actually use this kind of hydraulic containment to be able to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. So, so that's the idea to try and motivate, if you like, what, what we're about to, to do. So let's not get lost in the... What is that? <laughs> oh. Good, it's gone. So let's not get lost in the math. But so you, we said that if we can define this very simple flow field by an equation, then we might be able to do something with it to manipulate it. So stream functions are basically that idea. So the stream function is basically the idea that you can define an arbitrary equation. Don't know what it is. Um, could be y equals mx plus c or something. Uh, and if we're able to define this equation, it is true 
that the horizontal velocity, uh, it, sorry, the velocity in the y direction, so in that, this is using the ter terminology of the book, sorry, u is the velocity in the x direction, v equals the velocity in the y direction, so u is equal to what we've called vx, just terminology. So if you differentiate this expression, then you get the velocity of flow in the x direction. If you dif differentiate it with respect to x and look at the negative sign of this, then you get the velocity of flow in the y direction. Um, we can show that that has to be true just by doing something very straightforward. And that is if we take um, our continuity equation, and our continuity equation is what? It's rate of change of velocity in the x direction with dx plus rate of change of velocity in the y direction with dy is equal to zero. So I'm just going back to this expression here, nothing more than this. And so what we could do is we could substitute this term in here for this, and we could substitute this term in here for this, and if we do it, we get this expression. And if we multiply this expression out, we get de facto differentiating with respect some the function that's differentiated first by y, and then differentiating by y something that's first differentiated by x. It's, they're exactly the same functions, but differentiated in a different sequence, and with a negative sign. So by definition, we, they have to equal 0. So we think we can choose a function. If we choose that function, we think that function should represent velocity in the x direction and flow velocity in the y direction. And we've proven that that's the case because it satisfies continuity. So in other words, we're not getting mass randomly accumulating at points when it should be flowing into this little differential volume and flowing out in the same mass flow rate. So point number one is this arbitrary definition satisfies continuity, so it's true. Second point, there are three points to make. The second point is that we'd like to think that maybe we can use this function, arbitrary function that we've defined, to represent a streamline. And uh, on that streamline, we think that this magnitude should be constant. Actually, we've shown it's true, um, kind of in this, right? We said that in this particular case, y equals mx plus c. The equation of this line is... Um, y equals c, and so along the streamline, the magnitude, if this was our choice of psi, then this would be true, because it's just equal to a constant. And so this is a streamline, by what we think of a streamline. No flow is occurring across this, and it really satisfies this equation. So we've kind of shown it simply that that's the case before, but let's try and do it more rigorously. So let's think about a little particle of fluid that's traveling happily along its streamline. It's traveling at some velocity in the x direction, which we'll call u, and it's traveling at some velocity in the y direction, which we've called v already. So in a given small amount of time, it will have gone dx is equal to u times dt, right? So in a small amount of time, if it's going at this velocity, it'll have traveled the length dx at this point. If it's going in this direction, we can do exactly the same, and we'll find that it will have gone a small amount in the y direction. And so just by looking at similar triangles, we can look at the velocity in the y direction and the velocity in the x direction and divide them by each other. And the distance traveled in the y direction and the distance traveled in the x direction. And by similar triangles, this also has to be true as well. And so what we could do is we could rearrange this equation so that we write it as, um, what's it going to be? It's going to be equal to velocity times dx is equal to velocity u times dy, I think, right? Just by rearranging this. And if we substitute from the top of the page the values for velocity into here and velocity into here, then we end up with this expression here. And so, as a function of this, um, if we take the, the derivatives of this, um, uh, by definition, these cancel out because this, these are just one, and we're left with a change in this as a function of a change in this, and because they're orthogonal to each other, 
then this is equal to, to zero. It has to equal zero. So in other words, it's basically saying that as we go along this trajectory here, the magnitude of this thing is constant. And if that's true, then it's a streamline. And so what we might do is we might have a whole bunch of other streamlines where maybe the magnitude of this is equal to 1, maybe the magnitude of this is equal to 0, maybe the magnitude of this is equal to minus 1. If that's the case, then these represent individual streamlines. They're the, the streaks, if you like, of the trajectories of velocities that go along them. And just like in Bernoulli, there can be no flow across these streamlines. And so this stream tube, actually, a particle of fluid actually has to march along here. And so if that's the case, all particles of fluid on that line march along there. And therefore, they can't go across it. And so this has to be a stream tube that represents physically a tube that's separated from others. Okay? So point number one was that we can choose these arbitrary functions. We can define that they satisfy mass conservation. You don't get any net accumulation. So that's useful. So that means we're not violating any of our physical tenets. Second point is that we can show that magnitudes of this uh, stream potential, if they're constant, they define a streamline. And so if we can define an arbitrary function and look to where it's constant, and if, if it fits a particular geometry we want, then we've solved our problem, just like by doing the uh, superposition here of making sure that this is a a geometry, this is a boundary condition of this airfoil that we want to, want to replicate. So that's the second point. The third point is that because we have defined these two, um, the idea that along a streamline there can be no flow across it, we could look at flow between two streamlines and that forms, if you like, a stream tube. And what we could do is we could look at calculating how much flow occurs in the stream tube just by looking at a simple conservation uh, behavior. So we draw this line, this blue line here that joins these two points, two different points on a stream tube. And then that's at the upstream part. On the downstream part, we link the two ends of that with two orthogonal lines. We look at the flow in the x direction across the area of this, which is dy. We look at the flow in the y direction, which is across this area dx. And so also by conservation of mass, the stuff going in here has to equal the sum of the two things coming out of here. And so we can write a continuity equation which does that. We can substitute, so this is just these components here. U dy is just the amount coming out of this um, right-hand face. This is just the amount coming out of the bottom face. This is the amount going across the squiggly line, which is the flow in the stream tube. If we substitute our stream potentials in there, so remember we're just going to choose this equation, hopefully with some guidance, uh, but if we choose this equation, we know that it uh, satisfies this. Make the substitutions, and we end up with this expression here, if we, which is just the same expression we had previously, actually, right? If we have this expression here, we could integrate both sides. If we integrate both sides, we get the flow rate. And the flow rate, actually, is just the difference between the magnitude of the stream potential here and the stream potential there. So don't care about the math. Math isn't important. You'll do some um, uh, questions in your homework to differentiate functions based on given magnitudes of the stream function. But the basic idea is this. We want to be able to choose a stream function that we think makes sense. We can write an equation for that. And if we write an equation for that, we know that these stream potentials satisfy three things. It satisfies continuity, so it doesn't violate any physical law. The magnitudes of constant stream potential defines a streamline, and there can be no flow across that streamline, just flow along it. And between those streamlines, we can calculate the amount of flow that's, uh, that's in that stream tube, which we might think is useful for us because we can use it to calculate something. And we'll, we'll do an example exactly with that in a, in a second. And so that's basically the idea. So don't worry about the math. The idea is that hopefully we can draw basically a network. And you'll look actually at these things. We haven't drawn it on here. But if you look at these streamlines, 
If you could imagine, I wish I had a different color here, if you could imagine some lines which are drawn perpendicular to every one of those streamlines, like this, then what they would do is you could choose where you drew those so that each one of these little regions here was basically a square. Streamline on the top, streamline on the bottom, and basically the same length in the L direction as in the width. These two magnitudes each other. And so what you can do is if you can, the next step from this is if you can draw, bless you, if you can draw a net, a flow net that satisfies the conditions that it's basically a network of these curvilinear squares that satisfies the boundary conditions that you want to impose, then de facto you have a solution to your problem. And so, sounds kind of esoteric, but let's do it. So this is the idea. If we can draw a network of these streamlines, which we've called these um, uh, stream functions, and some lines perpendicular to these, then these are called streamlines, as we've called them. And these lines that are perpendicular to them are called equipotentials. Oops, what am I doing? So, E, Q, U, I, potentials. And on the equal equipotentials, the magnitude of head, which is equal to the pressure divided by the unit weight, plus the elevation of any point on there, is constant. And so, merely by drawing it, we can make some calculations as to flow rates of the system. So, don't worry about the math that we talked about um, so far. If, if it's blurring your mind, doesn't matter. Ignore it. Let's just re-engage with this. So this is the basic idea. Maybe we can draw a network that satisfies the conditions that we just said. Here is one such network. It flow, flows through a dam or a, a slope. These would be uh, equipotentials, sorry, streamlines. These would be equipotentials, which are here. And the idea is that so long as we are able to draw a flow net which satisfies the requirements that this length here, this length here is equal to this width here, and it's true for every single one of these, it's kind of true for every single one of these, then that is a flow net that is real, that satisfies our boundary conditions uh, because these are equipotentials here. And so this might be an equipotential boundary condition at the upstream side. So in other words, imagine that this is just a swimming pool here. If you look at the pressure at this particular point here, what's it going to be? So the pressure at this point is going to be equal to the pressure divided by the unit weight. The elevation of this point relative to this datum is equal to z. And together, these add up to be some magnitude of head. So we said before that the head is equal to the sum of the pressure over the unit weight, the elevation of the point, and we've thrown away this term. Don't care. Velocities are tiny in these systems. And so if you choose the point here, you get this. But also, in the swimming pool on the right-hand side, if you choose this point here, then what's the pressure at this point? It'll be this amount, and the head will be correspondingly larger. So this satisfies a requirement that we have a constant head on the right-hand side. So by definition, this happens to be an equipotential. Likewise, if we're in this uh, pond on the left-hand side, the same applies. The head at this point is going to be, sorry, the pressure is going to be equal to this, P over gamma. And the head is going to, the, sorry, the elevation of that point is equal to this. And so together, the sum of these, these two components is going to be equal to this. And so that's it. And so maybe let's do something that's a little more simple to understand. Um, so I'm going to do this. I got rid of that yesterday. I guess I really didn't take care of that, did I? Tomorrow. Manana. Uh, where are we? So, 8-3.
So here's the idea. So in lots of cities, you have this idea where you, um, you want to construct an underground parking garage. You cut out the ground surface and you put a sheet pile wall in it. And you're worried about, the reason you do that is to stop this falling into the excavation, but you also do it to keep the water out. If you wanted to draw a flow net for this and say the water level was at the groundwater surface, then a flow net for this would look a bit like this. This would be a streamline. There'd be a streamline along the wall that would look like this. There may be another streamline out here that would look like this. And that's our first stab at doing streamlines. We said by definition that this represents an equipotential. So if this is our our datum, let's say z equals zero, then this here is z equals h, say. So we think that the streamlines might look like this, and that so far we have three of them on here. We said that we want to be able to draw this network, this flow net, so this is a flow net, which is just a whole bunch of uh, rectilinear squares. I'm going to try not doing a very good job of doing it, maybe. Kind of. And so this represents one stream tube. And so we're going to talk about this, the stream tube that's enclosed, I really wish I did have some different colors, between this point here. And so what's the head that's work operating here? H is equal to H T head here is equal to zero. This value and this value, right? And so let's do something and stretch this out. What we could do is we could take just one of these little components. And if we did that, And we make this sum width dw. And we make this sum length dl. Because these are kind of flow, flow directions. We have the head on here, which is h1. Uh, and let's call it h0. Then, for instance, what we could do is we could calculate the flow rate out of here just by using Darcy's law. We stated it before in a slightly different way. It says the cross-sectional area times the hydraulic conductivity times the change in head over change in length. So if we want to calculate that for this geometry, what's the area? This is the area. The hydraulic conductivity is the material property. Which is in units of meters per second. It's a velocity, length, length over time. So that's a, a property of our system. Change in head is going from H1 minus H0. And the length of which it flows is this length dl. So this is this. So what we also said is that if we make this a square, so if it's a square, then by definition, dw equals dl. So get rid of those. So very simply, what we've done is we've shown that the flow rate through that little stream tube is equal to the hydraulic conductivity over the head drop and that's it. So that's the head drop that goes from here to here. We've said that these are equal potentials, and we haven't actually demonstrated, but because we've drawn this flow net, the drop in head from this location to this location is actually the same as the drop in head from the, this location to this location. So these head drops that occur between these locations are equal. So I haven't shown this, but equal drops in head from one exponential 
to the next. So in other words, in going from this point here to this one here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 drops. So what we could also do is we could take that geometry and let's stretch out this stream tube. And if we stretch out this stream tube, then it looks, it might change, it might taper as we go from the upstream to the downstream. I think we said we had eight drops, right? So this is the upstream. This is what we called HT. And we go one drop, two drop, three drop, four drop, five drop, <coughs> six drop, seven drop, eight drops. Right? So all we're doing is we're kind of, if you like, we're unrolling this between these two points. This magnitude here is H0. And so if you want to calculate what delta H is on here, which is the same as this value, this is delta H, then we just take delta H is equal to the difference on the total system divided by the number of drops. We'll call it number of drops. So number of drops is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Hopefully that's what we had here, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So, yeah. So in this case, number of drops equals 8. And so what we can then do is we can get the flow rate is equal to hydraulic conductivity times delta H, which is equal to hydraulic conductivity times the total head drop across the system, which is constant for this particular geometry, divided by the number of drops. And that's the amount of flow that we get in one stream tube. If we want to know, if we want to know total flow, then that's just the sum of all the stream tubes which equals the number of stream tubes you have multiplied by QS, which is equal to number of stream tubes, just the equation above, number of, sorry, the head drop across the system, which is across the total system, and number of drops. So, for instance, in this example, if, for instance, sorry, I didn't mean to move that off so quickly. In this example, if we take a hydraulic conductivity of one meter a second, which is a very big number, un unusually big, and we wanted to calculate the flow that's occurring in this system, then in this particular system, the number of stream tubes is equal to two, if we stop at the, the second one. The number of drops is equal to eight. The total head drop across our system, if this is equal to 10 meters, then delta H is equal to 10 meters. And so in this expression, we can calculate that the total flow rate is just going to be equal number of stream tubes to 10 meters divided by the number of drops, which is 8, which is 2.5, right? Uh, this is, these are non-dimensional, so this is length, um, this is hydraulic conductivity, sorry I missed out the one meter per second, so two stream tubes, one meter per second for the conductivity, uh, 10 meters for the head drop, it still comes out to be 10, 2.5 meters, but the units are, no, these cancel out because they're numbers, hydraulic conductivity, length over time, this is length, so it's in meters squared per second, which is the same as 2.5 meters cubed per second per meter. So it's a volume flow rate per meter run into the page. So we've played around with a bit of math, but the bottom line is, is that the idea is that if you can draw a flow net that satisfies these conditions of being these equi equidimensional squares, it satisfies the boundary conditions, in this case of this being a no-flow boundary across the, the airfoil wing, then de facto you have a solution to your flow equation problems.
and you can use that to calculate pressures and flow rates in your system. We did it for a very simple system for a groundwater flow system, but in the book you'll get a chance to do it for kind of stream potentials, and it's, it's, it's really a very, it's a little mathematical, but it's really very, very powerful technique. Okay. So I'm going to leave it there. So why we talk about stream tubes. We looked at those videos earlier on, um, and I don't really want to, to go into uh, in great detail uh, what we might do for the Navier-Stokes equations, but I will make this observation that ties things into what we did before. And so everything that we've talked about has been defined in terms of, of kinematics. In other words, it only satisfies this mass continuity. So if you remember, when we looked at conservation of mass, what we did was we took a little cube and we said that we had some volume going in, velocity going in, and we had some velocity coming out, which looked like this. And if we had that, what we could do is we could solve this upper equation, which is just the conservation statement. Right? And if we did that, we ended up with this expression here, a differential equation. And that's because the control volume that we chose was just x long, and in this particular case, I guess, z high, right? Nothing more than that. And it was a cube. It wasn't a square, but it was a cube that we used. I just drew a square for convenience. And so everything that we've done has come out of this expression, and we use that today because we talked about these stream potentials actually satisfy this continuity equation where we throw away these other terms, right? These are zero. And the only terms we worry about are these terms that are in the box here. But that only solves part of our problem. What we did was we used Darcy's law to kind of uh, effectively allow for the frictional losses in the system. If we really want to solve the systems of equations that we saw earlier on in those videos, what we have to do is solve for conservation of momentum. And we won't do that, you'll be glad to hear. But if we did want to do it, what we'd do is we'd use exactly the same idea. We'd talk about this control volume. We'd talk about um, velocities in on one side, out on the other side. This is just velocity v velocity in the x-direction plus some increment of velocity. We'd also think in terms of a fluid pressure applied on one side and a fluid pressure on the other side of equal to that plus a change in fluid pressure. And what we would solve would be this, which you'll recognize. or not necessarily in the x-direction, in all three directions. And so um, when we talked about conservation of momentum, we balance forces relative to the momentum flux into the volume versus the momentum flux out of the volume. And actually, we'd also have another term, which would be, we'll call a force, which is um, viscous, viscous losses. And we've talked about them, we've kind of called them HL is proportional to these viscous losses. And it actually comes out of the idea that from Newton's law of viscosity, we have some force which is equal to the velocity times the rate of change in velocity. So it doesn't matter. But the point is that we can get kinematics out of just solving for mass conservation. It doesn't say anything about conserving momentum in the system. If we want to conserve momentum to be able to do these jet calculations that you saw uh, on the video, then the other thing we need to do is we need to just solve momentum. We can solve momentum in three dimensions. We have x, y, and z. We can do it on a little cube, which is dx by dy, dz. And if that's our control volume, what comes out of it 
after a lot of manipulation um, is, and I won't subject you to this, you'll be happy to hear, is this. A set of equations called Navier-Stokes equations, and they relate to solving momentum in the x direction, in the y direction, and the z direction. And they include terms that we've kind of seen in our prior life. They include terms that relate to inertia, accelerating the fluid or decelerating the fluid. They contain terms that relate to the fluid pressure changes as you go from one location to another. The other term, I guess, that we should have put in here, don't mean to give you whiplash, but is the other thing, of course, would be that we have a weight of this, right? a body force. which is here, and viscous losses, which are basically Newton's law, which give you, etc. And so you end up with a very complex suite of expressions, which we can uh, deal with as we wish. And so uh, if you solve these three equations for conservation of mass, if you solve for conservation of volume, which is you know, just our dvx dx plus dvy dy plus dvz dz equals zero. Then we can solve for the variables we have. The variables we have are a velocity in the x direction, a velocity in the y direction, and in the z direction, and we have a magnitude of fluid pressure. So four variables that you have to solve for, four equations that allow you to solve for it, and so you can get a solution. So, so we won't use it any more than that, um, but merely to, to note that these expressions exist. Um, you can use them to solve simple geometries. Um, and if you use them to solve simple geometries, you find out that a whole bunch of the terms drop out. We would never, of course, ask you to derive these. These are kind of standard solutions. But certainly in the past, we've asked you uh, to be able to show that the solution that you get for one of these actually satisfies the differential equation just by differentiating it. And so I'm never sure whether it's useful to go through this or not to give an idea of exactly uh, what's important. Um, but for instance, if you wanted to know what the flow rate was through between two parallel plates as part of a duct, it seems like an esoteric question, but actually it's quite an important one because these ducts are actually just like fractures that fluid flows in the ground, in hydrofractures, in gas shales, etc. And so the fundamental solution for this is actually a very useful one if you're looking at permeability of porous media that has fractures going through it. And so it isn't completely uh, an abstract idea. But if you wanted to get, for instance, the, the flow velocity that occurs in this duct, then what you need to do is to be able to solve those, uh, the differential equations. And you can do that by starting to throw away terms that um, are zero within the system. So if you think about flowing through this duct, the one, the boundary conditions you, you could imagine being is that the fluid is sticky, and so it sticks to the sides of the duct and doesn't move, and so the drag on here gives it a zero velocity. So if you look at plotting the velocity profile across this duct, you'd imagine it would be biggest in the middle, smallest at the edges where it's actually stuck. And the other condition would be at this location here, the change in velocity in the x direction, which we're going to call u, and if this is in the, this is x, this is in z, I guess it's on there, right? So the velocity du dz is equal to what, right? This is horizontal, so there's no change in velocity at this particular point. And that's just from the fact that symmetry would suggest that it has to be that way just because it's going between two locations where it has zero velocity and one central location where the change in velocity has to be zero just because this is, you can imagine this, if you turn it on its side, is a flat peak of the hill where the, the, the change in velocity is zero as you go across this. And so what you can also imagine is that the only flow velocity you have is in the x direction. There's no flow upwards and there's no flow into the page. So if that's the case, you would surmise that this is true, right? That the, those two velocities are zero. This um, also suggests that 
the change in velocity in the x direction. In other words, if you look at the flow velocity here, and you look at the flow velocity here, and here as you go in this direction on the same line, there's no change in that velocity either. Because it, if you did, if it was a, a, a traffic jam, the cars all have to be moving at the same rate. Otherwise, you get some net accumulation. And so the other condition is that this velocity in the x direction, or the change of velocity in the x direction, has to be 0. And if we're looking also at the case where it doesn't change in time, you take a snapshot at time 0, the velocity profiles between these plates are some magnitude. Come back in 10 minutes. With space, it's not the same particles of fluid, but in space, it's still the same velocities that you have. So perhaps I don't want to belabor the point, but if you take these arrangements, um, if you realize also that as a function of uh, continuity, this has to hold as well, then the magnitudes of, of, I guess, this value here comes out of the fact that since the velocity is zero in y, the velocity is zero in z, as we've said here, then the derivatives of these also have to be zero. And if the derivatives of these are also zero, then this has to be zero as well. I guess I was making that defines this point here. So the point is, all the derivatives with respect to velocity in y and z are going to be zero. All the magnitudes of velocity in y and z are zero. All the second derivatives of those velocities are zero. Uh, the magnitudes of velocity change in the x direction are zero. And if you go back to this expression and start throwing those in here, I don't think it serves us very well to do that. We can end up throwing away a whole bunch of terms so that you end up only with terms which are a continuity equation, which we already said only has one relevant term, which is equal to this term here. And balance equations in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction, uh, only one of which is significant. We've seen this before as well. This says that as you go in the y direction, pressure doesn't change if you're on the same horizontal surface. So we don't care about that. That's just uh, for a static fluid. This says that if you go vertically down across the, um, uh, the duct or between the parallel plates, the pressure increases at the unit weight. Uh, we know that. It's just this linear profile in pressure, right? So it's just saying that the pressure variation across this is equal to P equals gamma Z, if you like, or minus gamma Z. And so the only relevant term is, is this one that we have to deal with. And so we have one equation to solve. Uh, let's not worry too much about that. So what do we do? We have this one equation to solve. Uh, integrate it once. You end up with a constant of integration. Integrate it twice. You end up with a second constant of integration. And this is your velocity profile across this. It has two constants in there that we have to figure out somehow. So what we do is we come back and we look at the boundary conditions that we applied. We said that this location where the z is equal to b, the velocity is 0. And we said also where z is equal to 0, then the velocity change is equal to 0. And so presumably we can use those to solve this. Um, if we look at the velocity change, this has to be equal to 0, right? du dz. No, it's du dx. What are, we going, what, are, what are we going to get in this? Yeah, we said du dz is equal to 0. Oh, where, are we, where are we? Getting myself lost here. So uh, we want to be able to substitute these to be able to solve for these variables. The change in velocity in the, zero direct, in the z direction so velocity in the x direction is this. Um, at this individual location here, the change in velocity with z is equal to 0. And so if we put into here the midpoint, which is z equals 0, then this equals 0, this equals 0. So c1, by definition, has to equal 0, which is this. If we know that c1 is equal to 0, we put it in here. And then we can solve for the magnitude of c2 which has to be equal to this. If you take it at the location uh, z equals b, right? we said at this point here that the value of velocity is equal to 0. 
So that particular location, the magnitude of this has to equal zero. We know that this is equal to V, this is equal to zero, and you can solve for the magnitude of C2, which is just going to be equal to this term here. So that's this. And if you substitute these values, C1 and C2, back into this expression here, you end up with some expression that gives you the velocity across the, the bound. So all it says is that as you go across this boundary, the flow rate across here is a parabola. It's a maximum in the middle where z is equal to 0, and it's a minimum of 0 on the sides where it's equal to 0. And from that, if you integrate it, you can get the flow rate. And the bottom line is, if you want to use this, and you have a system where you have a whole bunch of parallel fractures, which are separated by some spacing s, and have some individual aperture b, then the permeability of that system of rock is equal to the cube of the aperture divided by 12 times the spacing between the fractures. And so you could, it seems kind of esoteric to do this, but these are standard solutions for flow in parallel plates. You can think of those parallel plates as being fractures. If you use it in some way, then you can actually use that to get the magnitude of the permeability of the rock if you know the aperture of the fractures, which you rarely know, and the spacing between those fractures, or if you measure the permeability and look at the spacing between fractures in a borehole log, you can get the aperture. And the reason that's useful is that now if you do something like take gas out of the ground, the shale shrinks, and therefore the aperture gets larger, you have some way of being able to link, for instance, the change in permeability you get as you do that relative to some fundamental coefficient of that. Okay. I've gone on too long. So that's the last stuff that we'll do on, um, on energy loss. We've talked about the, the equations of conservation of momentum and, and mass together. Next time, we'll talk about dimensional analysis. So how we use groupings of non-dimensional parameters to be able to choose interesting experiments um, that allow us to say something about uh, behavior of fluids in prototype structures. OK, thanks very much. So some of the stuff we're doing might seem esoteric, but let's take a few minutes just to look at the kinds of things that what we will talk about today can be used for. We won't go this far, obviously, but I'll shut up in a second. But uh, a lot of the stuff uh, you see in movies these days is done just by, by modeling and then rendering on top of that. And so these are just a few examples, I think, of that. I guess that's a hose, right? Not a flower pot. So we worked originally with kind of Reynolds transport theorem. You draw some kind of box around your control volume. But what we talked about last time was in terms of conservation of mass, making that control volume a little differential cube. And of course, you see on the right-hand side of this, in two dimensions, exactly what that is. These little square boxes are those individual cubes. And by linking those together, both for conservation of mass and also for conservation of momentum, uh, you're able to solve a system of equations that allows you to kind of treat these uh, problems that you're looking at here. So, we won't do this, but of course, the stuff that we're talking about is the, uh, the entree, if you like, into being able to, to do that in some respects. So, amazing stuff that, that's done. And it always looks much better when you don't get a, a printout of uh, velocities and uh, pressures on a, on a tableau on paper, but you have it actually rendered in some way. <laughs> <laughs>
And so all of these methods basically divide up this lake into a whole bunch of little blocks and look at the fluid flow through those blocks from one side to the other uh, with those blocks being static. The other methods that you saw in the first couple of clips uh, of the, the flower pot squirting fluid treat it in a different way where you kind of follow along little particles of fluid as they move and use F, F equals MA basically to be able to solve for that. This is kind of dark. I guess it's a lighthouse at night, so I suppose it should be dark. I don't know how well you see this or not. So um, this might be what we aspire to, but I guess, like anything, it's, uh, it's baby steps first, and so we need to be able to understand the, the basics. So what, what I think we'll do today is we'll finish our stuff talking about um, stream functions, which, if you recall, are the ways of being able to draw streamlines and orthogonal equipotentials. Uh, we'll apply that to something called flow nets, which certainly environmental systems majors will see in their uh, 452 GSI class, uh, but it comes directly out of what we'll talk about today. And it's useful also in any other porous 